gotta go around. Oh. Red Rabbit Museum is like a church. Okay. You walk in, I've never seen a museum. <laughs> So it says it's recording. We're going to trust it's recording. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Giorgio Topolitis with the Samuel Proctor World History Program, um, Mississippi Freedom Project. Uh, what is your name and your date of birth? My name is Andrea Anderson Gluckman, and I was born on September 5th, 1974. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and I grew up uh, in between North Little Rock, Arkansas, and Memphis, Tennessee. And all of my extended family is from Elaine, Barton, and Helena, West Helena. What are the names of your parents and where were they born? My mother's maiden name, let's see, Barbara Janice Johnston. Uh, and then she, her last name was Davis when she passed. Uh, she was born in Monticello, Arkansas, grew up everywhere because she was a uh, daughter of Air Force. Um, her parents eventually, my grandparents, moved back to Helena after living overseas. And my father, his name now is Andrew Anderson, and he was born in Memphis, Tennessee. What are the names of your grandparents and where were they born? Um, so my uh, grandparents here, um, James Johnston, and uh, he grew up in, well, he was born in Red Bay, Alabama, and then he came to Elaine with his family as a sharecropper or tenant farmer. I can't get the, the straight story from anybody because they're all, they've all passed. Um, and that was in the late 20s, it was after the massacre, but they were here for the second big flood of 37. And then he and his family moved to Barton, and that's where he met my grandmother. My grandmother, her name was Alma Ruth Blush, and she was from a Swiss family that came to Barton from Kentucky. And um, it was a whole Swiss colony in Barton, Arkansas. And that's where she met my grandfather. Grandparents on the other side, I know less about. Um, my grandfather was born uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, and my grandmother was from Pennsylvania. There's kind of a, a murky story there because her father was a Russian and he died and he was not necessarily part of the family narrative, so. Uh, and their names? Um, okay, it's my grandmother, Lorraine Jibkowski was her original name. And then it was changed to Lorraine Davis because Jibkowski, I imagine, sounded um, like something you didn't want to have in Memphis. And then when she married my grandfather, it became Anderson. And her husband, my grandfather's Milton Raymond Anderson. Okay. Uh, who first immigrated to the US um, from your parents, grandparents' generation, um, and under what conditions? Excellent question. And honestly, we don't know the answers to all that, the, you know, how family, y'all know better than me, how family lore takes over, over time. Um, but on my, uh, on the Swiss side, they, it was my great grandparents and great, great grandparents who came to, at least to Arkansas. And I know because they're buried like down the road. <laughs> um, my, my, my grandfather, the one, the sharecropper slash tenant farmers from Alabama originally, they probably, it's a great, great grandparent who had immigrated from somewhere, England, Ireland, Scotland, nobody, nobody knows, nobody really cared. Uh, on my father's side, we do know that there was the Poland, Russia, like pale of settlement. He was, he was designated as, this is my great grandfather, he immigrated to the United States. He was designated as a Russian, but he fought in the Polish army. So, you know, nobody knows. Okay. 
and uh, then on the other side, they go way, it's, it's Scottish blood. They go way, way, way back in the South. That's all I know. Okay. Continuing with the demographic questions, sure. uh, what nationality do you identify as? Uh, as American. What ethnicity do you identify as? Uh, white. What race do you identify as? <laughs> I mean, I feel that's that's a tough question, but yeah, I mean, it has to be white because that's the it's the privilege I walk through the world with is from being perceived as that. So, uh, what is your sex? Female. What gender do you identify as? Female. Do you subscribe to a religious faith, and if so, which one? No, it would be more like a secular humanist, a Carl Sagan type. Who did you vote for in the last national, state, and local election? Uh, Democrats all the way down. Who are you going to vote for in the upcoming election? Democrats all the way down. Or Green Party. It just depends on what the, what the potential for outcome is. Um, have you, your, your parents or grandparents, uh, experienced prejudice or discrimination in the U.S.? Did your parents or grandparents share with you any stories about prejudice or discrimination they experienced? No. I mean, there, there's an assumption that uh, if there is a Jewish connection or whatnot, that that, you know, perceived discrimination or perhaps potential perceived discrimination may have been a part of the name change or just, you know, being concerned about anti-immigrant, whatever, but no. They, they really didn't, that they've shared. Have you ever taken any, any diversity, inclusion, and equality course in high school, college, or as part of your job? And if so, how did you feel about the course? Um, I've taken many. I've been lucky. Um, I have had mixed feelings depending upon where the courses come from and what the goal is. Um, so some of the best training that I had had was through ACORN, which is a community organization started out of North Little Rock, Arkansas, Mr. Wade Rathke. And um, in my experience, the direct organizing and the direct campaign work is a much better guide to diversity, inclusion, equity training than going to a diversity, equity, inclusion training, which I'm also in favor of. But um, I know people need to reflect on their own identity to be able to branch out, and, but the work shouldn't stop there. So uh, organizing through the community or doing, um, the other thing that was very helpful for me was I did some work with kids who had committed hate crimes or were designated as committed hate crimes. So you go in and talk about identity and then go through a process of exposure to community, community service and that kind of thing. But the pure book courses, um, you need more, in my opinion. Which social justice issue or issues are you most passionate about? And what is your level of involvement in related social justice movements? Oh, they're all connected. Um, I would say, um, I mean, in this country, I think it's, it's race and poverty because they're inextricably linked. Um, but the overseas work that I did before kind of came back to Arkansas-ish was, it, it was still, uh, you know, different versions of colonialism, you know, if it was in Palestine or South Africa or results of um, how communities try to move forward after mass violence, like in Rwanda or something like that. I mean, those are the things that gave me better tools to come back to the United States and go, oh, okay, because it's harder to see in your own blind spots. Um, so, but I mean, it, it comes back to access to resources and, and race and discrimination, I have to say would be uh, the big pot, and, but that also has to include gender. I mean, it's, it, it's, all, it's all related. It's just on, I think, where you start and where you have the most leverage to begin. And I'd say I'm, uh, I'm as involved as I know how to be right now, and that is through career and art and whatever, but I mean, there's always more to do. I'm learning. How did you learn about these issues and who inspired or supported you to get involved? 
Well, this is going to sound kind of weird. Um, my best friend growing up in Arkansas was Palestinian. Uh, and there are Palestinian communities everywhere, just like, I mean, there are Jewish communities everywhere. And, you know, there are just certain populations that are really sprinkled throughout the world. And there is a community in Little Rock. And I think I learned, or was able to learn more about what was happening to Palestinians, even though I didn't understand it at the time, and was able to uh, later able to extrapolate what, you know, um, land theft and extraction of resources and exclusion from power structures and all that, how that manifested in a deeper way here. But I mean, I grew up here. I, so how can, you know, you can't not see what's happening around you. The, but the international piece, I think, helped me gain a little bit more depth and gave me other entry points into it because I was very active in the peace and justice community, you know, like in high school, whatever, here in Lerat, the, the Iraq war, um, protesting against the Iraq war. But uh, the, 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 the Palestinian and, and a number of different Arab folks in Arkansas really helped me. Um, and then, of course, opened me up to, to where my family's from. Where did you come into contact with Palestinian community. School. Um. Kismet. Um, it just happened to be, you know, I mean, it's this amazing family, and there's still, a lot of them are still here. The, the Abdeens, and they're from um, Hebron. And for a period of time, my friend moved back to Jerusalem. When you say here, what do you mean? Where do they live? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Little Rock. But, but not just Little Rock. That's just where this group of brothers was. And then they, you know, married and had families and whatever. But, um, yeah, the happenstance. Have family members of yours, like your parents, as far as you know, aunts, uncles, um, if you have sisters or brothers mm -hmm. as well, have they participated in any social justice movements, organizations, or protests? And if so, what did they share with you about their experience? And how did it make you feel? Sure. Um, you know, I, I've, I've learned to see how progressive they were in their time now that I'm older. Um, so, yes, uh, my, my mother, father, and sister, my parents are divorced, so it was a different set of experiences with each. But, you know, I think my father was progressive in a number of ways, but he was not the kind who was going to sit down with you and be like, hey, I'm going to tell you about history and I'm going to tell you how messed up this is. It was much more of a, you know, who he hung out with, what was important to him, what he talked about. He was a counselor in a prison. So it was like, I felt like it was this, all this anecdotal stuff, but hugely impactful. Um, and my mom was, you know, it was complicated because she was the daughter of this Air Force, you know, was very patriotic, but was the most progressive person to this day that I had ever known. But the way she talked about it was really different. And somebody who's not from here talking to her would be like, ooh, flag waving white lady, you know? And I, and I, and I hear that. Um, but there are a lot of people in the South, I mean, everywhere, that are radically progressive, but you have to know the, the language and you have to pay attention. And it, you gotta tap into it. So I think it just, it took me a while um, but yeah, we went to protest together, but it was after I was older. Um, you know, this, she's passed now, but this like, Roe v. Wade piece would kill her. Uh, all the, January 6th would have killed her had she not already passed. So um, definitely influence. It was all, a lot of it was just subterranean. And my sister is also very involved, but she, it, you know, has a different entry point because she is trying to change things from being parts of institutions. Whereas I'm kind of like outside going, it's really messed up. Why don't we change it? You know, but she's, uh, you know, worked for the government and worked for the Defense Department. So she has a different way of doing, trying to get at the same outcome. Uh, have you been involved in any way in uh, supporting uh, members of any of the following social groups, whether it be African Americans, Black Americans, Latinos? <laughs> Yep. Indigenous peoples, yep. Asian Americans, women, members of the LGBTQ community. All of the uh, above. Can you talk about that experience? 
Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there are multiple ways to support. And I think one of the difficulties, because I have children now, and um, when, we, you know, kids want to think about agency and what they can do. And so I've had to think more about what does it mean to, you know, be an ally or to be a supporter of an organization. And money is essential if you have it, whatever little pocket of privilege you have. Um, but, you know, it needs to be more substantial. It needs to be in your lifestyle. It needs to be in how you spend your own money, how you raise your family. So, um, you know, I don't see it as like an outside, I support these groups. I, I try to I try to live that way. And when I know better, like Miss Ma Angelou said, when you know better, you do better. And when you learn about what certain companies are doing, then you say, okay, I'm going to participate or I'm not going to participate. And you, you know, take your kids to protest with you and you, you know, you just, you do what you can in your days. It can't be separate from how you're living your life. And it applies equally. So if you're going to support LGBTQ, you got to support Indigenous Americans. And if you're going to support Black, American, uh, Black Americans, you need to be able to go over and support um, Latinx communities. Um, I just realized that I had, two, I had two more demographic questions for sure. you. And one is, uh, uh, what is your level of education? Mm -hmm. And then what is your occupation? Uh, I have a master's degree. So that's the highest as I got. And, um, the, and my occupation now, I mean, I was a political analyst, so that's what I studied to be. And I worked in the Middle East for quite a while. And then I had babies. And that changes everything for a woman because um, you can't get back in where you were, and especially in political analysis. So I went to teaching because at least there's, you know, a, a piece of the cliff that you can hang on to during your, your period uh, trying to take care of your family. So now it, it's a patchwork. It is, um, I've finally been able to become an artist and do be able to support myself to some extent through that. But that, that's, that's all next to impossible. So uh, I would say photographer, artist, but I do a lot of work in New York now with art installations and it's all social justice, justice focused and we've been able to get funding. Um, but I still teach and uh, I homeschooled my children for quite a while and that took up quite a bit of uh, energy. Well worth it. Uh, what was your master's in? It was in theological studies and political science. So it was the Harvard Divinity School and the uh, JFK School of Government. But it's mostly looking at how Islamic governments function or don't function, what role does religion play, and but kind of backing up and like what, how do people, um, how do people try to manifest what's important to them in belief systems? Because if you grow up here, you can't get away from like, because I'm not religious. You know, I haven't told you that but you cannot get away from it. And so in order to not be a hateful human being, that's why I studied religion, because I was feeling overly saturated because my friend's family, I mean, they were religious as well, they were Muslim, and um, you know, it's a very hyper evangelical area. And so you, got, you have to understand it, even if you are not of it, you are still from it. And you gotta know the language to get work done. Um, let's see, the next question is, how did your family respond to learning that you are an activist or advocate uh, for social justice issues? They were fantastic, very supportive. Um, I know that they, as parents are, because I'm just talking about my nuclear family, um, had concerns um, and we're, you know, we're nervous at times because the activism is also international. And so it's, you know, harder if you're overseas to try to get to your kids, but, um, very supportive. And, um, I think it was probably irritating at times, but, uh, you know, kind of self-righteous young person stuff that you go through, but, uh, have continued to be supportive. How did they express that support to you? By not giving me a hard time, I think is probably the most I could ask for. And for, you know, over time that would turn into, you know, proud of you or I'm glad you're telling this to your kids or, 
you know, uh, but I, there was definitely a mutual learning process because it's not, I'm trying to figure this parenting thing out and you know, you think that you're gonna go in and you're gonna be like, this is how you're gonna live your life and that is so not it. And it is this co-learning experience every single day. And I know like, especially my mom was really open to that. She just, even at the end of her life was still like, ah, you know, I wanna learn about that. Tell me about gender fluidity. What does that mean? You know, it's, that's my aspiration is that I'm able to maintain that too. Are you a member or financial supporter of any social justice or advocacy <clears throat> organization? Mm -hmm. uh, if so, which one? And what motivated you to become a member or supporter? Sure. There, it sounds, I don't want to sound whatever, but there were a bunch. Um, and, you know, some of the one, it depends on, um, you know, I'm able to be supportive at this point. So I tend to kind of float on what, what I think needs the most attention at the moment, you know, or where the help might be most helpful. So uh, right now, you know, obviously a lot of money to Planned Parenthood and, um, and such, but you know, Southern Poverty Law Center, grassroots um, law organization. I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn about groups that uh, are kind of bare bones and trying to, trying to figure out from other people who have already done the work, like, Sean King, I know people have different feelings about Sean King, but you know, like I'm, I was a founding member of the North Star and you know, he, and, and there's a lot that he says that I think is absolutely right on. And, and for example, in trying to rethink the uh, justice system, they're working on getting progressive DAs in office. So all the money goes to that. And you know, it's just like pick, pick your starting point, but what, what's the outcome? And uh, so, I recently tried to put a lot of my support into into that effort, but and there's so much need. Um, so I don't know. Uh, it, it, it shifts a lot, but I'm a member of a whole bunch of organizations, and we we give what we can when when we can. Can you speak to your involvement in the Elaine Legacy Center? Mm -hmm. So even though my family um, lived down the road, apparently uh, before I was born. I, and, and I heard them talk about Elaine all the time and we would drive through, but I didn't learn about the massacre until I was out of graduate school. In fact, it was just a few years ago. And I don't live under a rock, like I really don't. And I learned about it when I was in New York, because that's where I live. And so I tried to learn what I could and all the people who would know about it in my family or would be able to speak to it, whether or not they would have all passed. So I asked my living family members, did you ever hear anybody talk about this? Do you, oh yeah, well, you know, something happened down in Elaine, but it was really not, it's kind of crazy because you think, how could people not know? People didn't know, people didn't talk about it. And um, so anyway, I cold called Mary, because I just went online and uh, cold called her and said, if I come to Arkansas, can, can you give me something to do? And she asked me what I could do. And I said, I can teach and I can take pictures. <laughs> and that's the extent of what I can do at this moment. So she said, go out and take some pictures. And uh, that's where it started last year. And the pictures became more an issue of like going out to some of the areas that are thought to be mass grave sites and photographing them. And I got a drone so we can fly over a lot of these areas and uh, but that, of course, you develop relationships and friendships, and it's been able to evolve into a lot of other things. So I'm now technically the artist in residence who's not in residence, but it gives me a foothold in the organization to try to help fundraise. So. Uh, have you been able to uh, isol uh, identify burial sites? Well, see, therein lies the rub. Um, it's, I know that they've done a lot of work long before I came along with like forensic archaeologists or whatever, but trying to identify like where was hoop spur, you know, and again, and then you get into the whole narrative issue and what part of the narrative do you focus on? And so some of that work had been done, but there are the two big complications that I've been told about are one, 
nothing here is going to be living, nothing here is going to survive decomposition. Nothing. Because of floods and because of the soil and the richness of the soil. Uh, so, you know, I imagine there have been bodies and, and graves where we're like, kind of like New Orleans, right? That's going to be hard, number one. But, uh, you know, I think even bigger issue is that people, people didn't talk about it. And then we come up against the really interesting issue, I think, like for the museum, and this is the brilliance of the work that y'all are doing, is that, you know, do we need to have bodies to prove that it happened? And where do oral narratives fit in terms of establishing truth in history? And you know what I mean? But I mean, it gets, and I'm not trying to be all you know, metacognitive, but it's like, how are we thinking about truth and how are we thinking about how we're going to present history? Because that's going to be, be a museum without artifacts. But yet that doesn't mean that it's not real and it's not true. So um, all that to get back to your question, they haven't, to my knowledge, been identified as burial sites because there has been forensic evidence as such. And I don't even know how people would begin to look for that. Um, so it, it's based on stories that people have told over the years. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, speak to the um, the memorial in Helena, Helena, sort of your Helena. Yeah, thank I'm you. Sorry. No, I'm sort of your your uh, uh, your view of the politics surrounding what. It, that yeah. memorial and anything you happen to know associated with its establishment or, you know, since then. Yeah. First of all, I got some great pictures if y'all want to, some really, really good pictures of, <laughs> I mean, uh, they're curated for sure though. Um, well, you know, I, I, I have to be honest and say that I have really heard a lot from folks here about how they feel about it. So I have not talked to the people who funded it. So I, I do want to be fair in the most general sense. At the same time, it absolutely baffles me why it's not here. And just being the, the nudnik that I am, like why, you know, just wishing that that money could have been put into the living memorial of, of Elaine. I mean, y'all have been downtown. Um, so it seems, I'm not trying to be crass, but it feels, you know, feels performative and huge investment. And uh, that doesn't mean that it's not okay. And that it's not like the fact that it's done is important. When I've talked about the memorial, like the high school kids back in New York, they're like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't memorialize it. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that's true. Uh, but then like, are you allowing people to appropriate the mourning process and the grieving process too. Because, there were, have y'all heard about the tree? You heard about the willow tree? Uh, no. Oh uh, no, that's, you, a could, that's a whole different could you, tree. Could you speak to that? Okay, uh, sure. So there uh, was a willow, I think it was a willow tree that was planted after the massacre in, you know, in memorial of the, of the survivors and those who were killed. And I believe, but I'm not 100% sure that it died of disease over time. There was another one planted and uh, fairly recently, and it was cut down purely just in the middle of the night, um, a few months after it had been planted. What year was this? I think it was 2019. We'd have to ask James, but he has pictures. And so uh, another one was planted. But I mean, there are. I, I, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn because I don't know what Miss Mary has has uh, shared, but you know the building was set on fire here too, after the after the sign went up, and in both instances, from what I have heard, the law enforcement response was, "Oh, it's just kids," you know, it's just kids. So um, you can take that where you will. I wasn't here for it, but you know, there is a. There are, are, I would imagine, plenty of folks, not necessarily even in, in Elaine, maybe in Elaine, but in surrounding areas who this is a threat. 
this project is a threat. Um, Y'all coming in is a threat. Me coming back in is a threat. And, um, you know, it, it, it echoes a lot of, I think, what we've seen in the country writ large over the past uh, eight years of this, you know, great feeling of um, being displaced and of things changing and, you know. So, yeah, yeah, y'all can see it right up there. But there is a new tree, and it's beautiful, and um, we're hoping that it will survive. That's why it's a symbol of the museum. Were you at the uh, break, uh, breaking of the ground for the memorial? Were you at the ceremony oh, yeah. when it was? Uh, no, I was not. I was not. I have been many times since, um, and it looks like, I mean, there's, I'm not a geologist, but there's something going on with that stone, and it's like it's leaking. Uh, but I wanted to photograph it before it changed, if it does change. So, you know, I, I know I've heard people here say majority uh, not being satisfied with that and being vocal about it. But then, of course, for outsiders looking in, that can look like you're not being, you know, receiving of, of kindness. Of, you know what I'm saying. So it's complicated, but you can appreciate that. And then there are other people who are fine with it being there. Uh, some people who don't care, but that, just saying it's a lot of money that if one has, you know, I mean, it's, it's not my money, so I can't say. <laughs> what protests have you participated in, and can you speak to your experience? Oh, good Lord. How much time you got? If you could provide some anecdotes. Okay. Um, in, in the United States? And abroad. Okay. Um... I would say, I mean, the biggest ones have typically been for me in three categories, and that would be Black Lives Matter and what came before. So much came before. Um, the, you know, pro-choice, pro-woman, <laughs> pro, please let me live, um, and anti-war have been like the, the three big categories, but it's been in, you know, many different places. And I think I probably run the gamut, like a lot of people my age of emotions with it, that you you have to have an outlet and you have to have camaraderie, especially when you're younger. Um, but that runs dry pretty quickly. And you start trying to think about how else you can invest your energy, but I still think protest is extremely important. I am a student of the Saul Alinsky, you know, Saul Alinsky, you know, and the, the, the direct organizing and take it to the leaders. And so I know how important that is and how important you gotta have elders and I'm getting to be one in, you know, out there and not just, you know, kids. That's so important and we got to learn from them, but they need to see us represented out there too, or me, I'll speak for myself, uh, represented out there. But it, it gets harder, you know? Um, when, a, you know, an ideal situation, because you, you want to protest to make a point, but then to have a conversation, I think it has to be a different format. Were you a participant in any protests here in Helena no. about the monument? Were there any protests here about the monument? That's a great question. I don't know, because I left Arkansas when I was 17, and I've always come back. But, well, actually, it's not true. I went to college here. <laughs> I feel like I left then, but, um, I, I mean, I would imagine. I know that even from friends and family uh, and whatever in Little Rock and who were community organizing talked about stuff that was happening, but the, these folks would know, not me. Um, growing up as a child here, were you ever told any stories about the massacre from white people? Nada, nada, nada. But I mean, I didn't learn about it till I was much older too. But I can say one interesting thing, but I, it's not a first-hand thing, is that I have interviewed some white folks from Elaine who, um, on my little crappy Tascam, who were um, allies and may not have even known it during the massacre. Folks who had grandmothers who hid people um, and, you know, harkens back to World War II. And there's definitely, there's, there, that is here. And that does need to be talked about, I don't think necessarily in terms of trying to make a moral equivocation, but 
to help white people in this area know that there are other roles to have, if that makes any sense. Um, have you ever witnessed any violence at a protest or rally? Oh, yeah. Uh, if so, can you describe what happened and how you felt? I was pissed. <laughs> um, you know, get scared, get angry. Uh, you don't know what to do. Um, mostly from law enforcement. But, I mean, also counter-protesters. And the ones that tend to freak me out the most are the white supremacists. Any anecdotes? None that I can share. What voter recruitment drives have you participated in, and can you talk about your experience? So, um, gosh, that's a really important thing, and I haven't done that in a lot of years. But uh, we did, when especially through ACORN, they did a ton on registering to vote civic education, um, but also trying to get felons their right to vote again. And uh, that was a harder sell for a lot of people. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know but a lot of the folks we were talking to didn't know that they could register because they had been convicted of a misdemeanor or whatever they had been told. So, I mean, voter education is hugely important and it is not, I'm not an expert, but I'm a good foot soldier for that kind of thing. So I got kicked out of hundreds of parking lots in public areas <laughs> for petitioning and, and, and asking questions. But I mean, there are organizations out there who really know what they're doing. So I just kind of, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just find one of the organizations and do the footwork. In your view, what is white supremacy? I think it's a way of life. Um, it's a mindset. It's a political system. It's infrastructure. Um, it's a disease. It's a theology. I'm not giving you specifics because it's all those things. I don't know. I feel like it's almost sometimes the, at least the the effects of it feel like water because you're just swimming in it or, or air, you know. And it's a different experience for me than it's going to be for, for James or for Queen or whatever. Absolutely. But it feels that um, prolific. And I think it just manifests differently. So all my experiences living in other places in the United States and especially in New England and I went to school in Boston and living in New York or whatever is that there's somehow this idea that there is an absence of it or that it has been tamed or brought under control whenever you can look at communities and, and, and redlining and loan structures, and you can see it everywhere. And you're like, wow, y'all just really don't. <laughs> you don't know how this works. I mean, yes, it is egregious here, but it's, um, it's everywhere. And it, 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 it harkens back to extractive economies and colonialism and, and uh, you know, appropriation of native lands. To me, it's just all one big ball of mess, one big hot mess. In your view, what is whiteness? Ooh, these are good questions. Um, you know, I would, I'm not, I, I would need more whiteness in what, in what sense? I'm looking for you to sort of position it, define it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think it could it could look very different in in the sense of like if it is whiteness meaning white privilege the essence of being able to be white in in, in this country in this economy um, would look different. Um, I think for a lot of people, whiteness is not being something else, you know, uh, and, and that is part of the difficulty. I think a lot of people, you know white people feel whenever they're expressing, you know, I'm thinking not white people, I'm thinking white people who, you know, like Trump supporters, who might feel this severe threat of um, being 
you know, usurped or being dislocated or being threatened. Um, you know, I don't mock that because that is very real for them. I think it is completely misguided and I think the reasoning is wrong and et cetera, et cetera. But the feeling of it that, that folks have is real. So it's like, so how do we address that? And that to me is the, the toxic whiteness of, of not knowing where you're feeling like you're awash in this sea where you should have a certain life and a certain lifestyle and a certain identity, but you don't because those same structures that white supremacy really is, is what has created this horrible situation for you. I just, um, so I think for some people it becomes an identity. For some people it can, it, it, it's a burden. And um, I think it can be interpreted in a million different ways, but it always comes with privilege in my experience. Do you think there is any uh, overlap or any differences, any, any similarities or differences between white supremacy and whiteness? Well, I'm sure there are tons of overlaps. I don't know that I would say it was uh, an exact, uh, like you could trans, what's the word transpose, juxtapose them exactly. Although that, that may be the case sometimes. Um, I think somebody can experience whiteness or like being white, if you, if I was going to define it like that without being, uh, or without wanting to perpetuate white supremacy. Um, but I mean, if you're white or perceived as white in a white supremacist culture, maybe the overlap is a lot more than I had, than I would want. I mean, that, that anybody would want to believe. Honestly, it's a really good question. I don't know. What advice would you give individuals who self-identify or can be externally categorized as white regarding participation in social justice, justice movements, organizations, mm -hmm. or protests? Uh, use your privilege. Use it. Use it. Use every bit of it. Um, and it, whatever that means. And for a lot of years, I think I was fighting the fact that I had that privilege because, you know, I knew it wasn't right that I had it just for that, but I didn't, I guess I wasn't mature enough yet to really, uh, I needed to evolve beyond that to say, all right, <laughs> get over yourself. Now you have to be able to use that. Use your, your educational opportunity, use your um, contacts, use your networks, use all those things that may or may not have been um, directly linked to being white, but certainly have been elevated because you are. And, and don't do it to go and save the day. You go and you amplify the work that's being done. And so like I knew with Elaine, I did not need to come in and be like, oh, you know, the prodigal daughter, you know, n none of that BS. It's, they know what they're doing. We need to amplify it and we need to be able to make connections uh, to resources because systemically, historically, institutionally, um, people haven't been uh, haven't been allowed that privilege. So yeah, use your privilege, and don't stop. You're gonna be old like me. You still gotta be out. There. <laughs> um, is there anything else you would like to add uh, that we did not discuss? Uh, well. I think this is probably something that's pretty obvious, but I think it's important to mention, uh, is that one of the things that was really imperative for me to really evolve and to get to where I am now, and I still have a lot of growing to do, is the, like we were talking about, the, the international piece, being able to look at social justice or the importance of civic institutions, civil society, uh, institutional oppression, I mean, whatever it is, and uh, honestly be able to extrapolate that. It's hugely important. And, um, and like for me, I kind of did it backwards because, you know, you know things aren't right and you don't have the language for it, you don't have the whatever for it, and then I was able to be in other situations and go, holy shit, you know, this is... <laughs> You know, and then what are the tools that we can use? And so 
the big thing I tried to do, um, I'm still trying to do is after school, um, I did a lot of research in South Africa and in Rwanda on transitional justice infrastructures. So if you look at Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Unity and Reconciliation Commission, but places where people can't just be performative, you've got communities of victims and perpetrators, even though that gets messy too, living in the same areas and reconstructing economies and reconstructing communities. And shit that happened here was not that long ago. And so to see what people have come up with given the resources that they have, um, obviously very different situations, I was looking at, okay, well, how does that become part of something for Palestinians? Because that, again, that was my entry point. I should have been thinking about how does that become a part of a national reparation structure? And obviously it's gonna be very different, but a lot of the tools are the same and it begins with stories and it begins with oral narratives. It begins with all the stuff that y'all are doing. So just know how appreciative I am and I see you, I see this work, I see how absolutely imperative it is and you know, with any luck, this will bring Elaine back. This is uh, Sebastiano Coco. And so I have a question that came up in my mind. So obviously we're in Elaine, Arkansas, and we are in a place where, you know, when you look at a lot of opportunity, very lacking, et cetera, et cetera. And so stuff's not enough to keep people in, let alone bring more people in. But so something that I think about is so many of us, you know, we're gonna go back to where we're mostly at, or we already work with major institution. We're in completely different areas of the country, but it's 21st century, we can be connected. And so what are ways in which you think that those of us who are geographically distant can still maintain a connection, sort of like even more year round instead of just right. on just one main trip, you know? That is a fantastic question. You all are an impressive set. Um, well, there are lots of ways, I'm sure, and I have to say that James and Mary and, I mean, obviously Paul um, and Nan, I mean, it's a good team of, uh, there's already a brain trust who's working to think about um, all the different possibilities uh, of, of, of staying connected, and that's a struggle that I have. Like, I gotta go back to New York day after tomorrow. So it's, but a few quick things. One is, um, you need to know what you've got to offer. And uh, as, you know, the expert that you are, as the program that, that you are, and like whatever skill set you have. And, you know, it, it's one of, the th one of the things that I'm learning to do is to go into places and say, hey, okay, I can do these five things and I'm just gonna go and do it unless you tell me to do something else because it's like, my crazy analogy, it's like when you have a baby and people come up with, what can I do? Or somebody's passed and what can I do? No, you need to go in and say, here, this is an idea we have, what do you think? And um, so that's one piece of it, but now I'm gonna give you some, it's gonna sound contradictory, but it's not, is to come in and amplify the work that they are already doing. So maybe it could be that y'all have like a, I don't want to say mentor because it's not real. I don't want to create a hierarchy, but like somebody that y'all connect with while you're here. Maybe one group is attached to James. One group is attached to Queen or to Kenny, who does the vacant lot farming or whatever, but somebody that you keep up with. And I try to keep up with all of them because I've really grown to, to love them and their families. Um, but to have like that one connection and just check in relationships take time and you're gonna and I know you know this because you're the expert but you will get a very different interview and a very different narrative once you craft that relationship and that's where it's like the Middle East again too because you got it you're not gonna go over and make a deal you're gonna go over and then you're gonna go back and then you're gonna go back you're gonna go to the graduation you're gonna go to the birthday party and then you're gonna have a conversation about um, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. So, you know, make that, they know what needs to happen. They've got the ideas. So you come in knowing what you can do and you, you keep that relationship, take care of them. They're tired, you know? 
they've been working. And we go back and do our own thing, and then they're, they're still here. So leverage your resources, come up with some ideas, throw it at them, throw all that spaghetti on the wall, something's gonna stick. Um, but you gotta stay in touch. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your willingness to participate and for sharing this time and space with us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and conclude the interview at this point.